Thank you very much, Lee Ming, and thank you to uh, Jose, Jonathan, um, Jens, Michael, and Richard for what, what, what that was an awesome session. You're sitting in the audience and you're hearing these people get up and just you know speak openly and freely about uh, what it takes to be get offshore wind happening in uh, the APAC area and lessons learnt from around the globe. It was really inspiring. I hope everyone else found it as inspiring or as, or as inspirational as I did. Um, we've been the first. Well, the, all the morning sessions we've had speakers speaking at you. Now we're having the first uh, panel discussion where we would like your, you to contribute. Uh, so at the start of the day, maybe those people that weren't in the audience, I asked everyone to download the conference app. And so in the conference app, uh, there's an ability to ask questions of the panel, and so I'll be moderating the panel. I'll keep an eye on the iPad for questions coming in. So how you need to, what you need to do is you need to go into the program session, and then you'll see the program that we're in. Click on that, and then you can start to ask questions there. Um, the way that we're going to do this panel is we're going to have uh, Shashi Bala from uh, Brinkman, who's going to come up and give a 15-minute uh, overview about setting the scene, and then I'll invite the panelists on stage, and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion. This session is actually around uh, the APAC region, the, the tremendous opportunities that it presents, and we'll look at ways to, uh, the, the pathways to capitalise on those opportunities, how to minimise the roadblocks, and to harmonise and build out the volume in the market that will allow the supply chain to keep track, uh, while still meeting the climate targets. And then we'll start to explore some of the other uh, floating offshore wind and hydrogen and what opportunities they bring to the market. Um, as I said, we really want to keep this interactive and we really want to keep this practical and focus on the here and now. I think that the first uh, speakers gave a very good high level overview. Now we can actually get into the reads a little bit and start to ask these uh, questions of our speakers. So I'd like to introduce to the stage Shashi Bala from uh, Brinkman. Please make Shashi welcome. Thank you, Stuart. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for, thank you, Jivik, for uh, having me here. In the next uh, 10, 12 minutes or so, uh, we're going to talk about how the offshore wind is likely to evolve in the next uh, decade. I represent a company called Brinkman, based out in Aarhus, Denmark. We provide research and advisory services to renewable energy players. In the interest of time, let me skip that and jump right into the topic. The fundamental starting point for any industry is demand, and ours is no exception to that. Let's look at how the industry is unfolding for the next decade. But prior to that, I would like to draw your attention to what happened in the past decade and the one before. Industry has demonstrated that we're able to pull off annual install capacity that's two and a half times the size in the previous decade. And we would expect more or less a similar phenomenon going into the next decade where we're going to see the average annual installations going to grow by more than two folds. We had a fair representation in the earlier sessions by the developers, and these companies would pump in more than $2 trillion worth of investments into the projects in the next decade. We have a very promising outlook for the next decade. However, there are a plethora of challenges that my predecessors have touched upon, more so when it comes to offshore wind. Some of them here were also in the Win Europe Copenhagen early this year at the GWEC session, where I made a comment that the supply chain, the turbine OEMs, were in the midst of a perfect storm. Unfortunately, now that's extended to the offshore wind sector as well. And why is that? If you look at the developments more so in the recent times in the United States and as well as in Europe, 
We all have become victim of cost inflation. Prices shot up north of 40, 45%. What happens to the projects? Some of the projects in United States, the developers failed attempts to renegotiate the PPS at a higher price have left the assets development stranded. And the same is the case in Europe as well, specifically in UK, where one of the leading developers have decided to cancel the project, despite receiving the CFD mechanism approvals. Now, when we look at APAC, the story is not exactly the same, but nonetheless, we have to downgrade significantly in the APAC, primarily stemming from China. China, for the last 12 consecutive quarters, they were able to lower the prices of the projects and as well as the equipment by about 50%. For the first time since the beginning of this quarter, we have seen that the prices in China are also increasing. What all this means that the projects are delayed or in some cases shelved. So that puts stress on the industry and the numbers move right hand side. As we are all familiar with the expression, there is light at the end of the tunnel, there is light at the end of the period. Now let's look at that. If we talk about the APAC offshore market, which is today just over 30 gigawatts of cumulative capacity, by end of next 10 years, it's going to grow by a whooping nine folds. That brings in a lot of opportunities and, of course, equally challenges. And unsurprisingly, this region is largely dominated by China. About 70% of the new build in the region will be in China. Now let's take out China out of the equation and see how the markets are evolving in the next decade. As you can see, the activity is essentially back and loaded. And why is that? I would like to pick an example here about the pioneering market and also the biggest market in the region, Taiwan. With the offshore auctions, round one and round two, back in 2018, April and June respectively, the capacity that was awarded, part of the capacity was supposed to be operational by end of last year. And unfortunately, it spilled over to this year. So that roughly translates to five years after the projects were awarded a remuneration mechanism. And we would expect a similar trajectory in most of the emerging offshore markets. But nonetheless, as you can see, the number of markets that would deploy offshore wind in the next decade are increasing. We spoke about the global demand, offshore demand, APAC, APAC excluding China. Let's take a look at the supply chain. Who are the turbine OEMs that are likely to supply to the offshore wind segment? We try to demarcate that between China and Asia Pac excluding China. As you can see, China is at the verge of exploding in a positive sense. As you can see that essentially there were about three, four players for the likes of Shanghai Electric, Goldwyn, Envision, that were dominating the supply space. But today, if you look at, in the last 12 months or so, the companies that have zero track record in the offshore wind sector have already secured commercial scale projects for the likes of Windy and CRRC in China. And we hope that in the next 12 months, the, the other player, Sani, is going to join the bandwagon. When you look at Asia Pac excluding China, which is largely dominated by Siemens and partly Vestas. And we're going to see that GE is going to join the party soon on the back of a significant win in Japan first round auctions. This space will be essentially dominated by three global players. Now, after looking at the supply chain, 
the next question is, what sort of technologies are we expecting in the market? And why technology is important? Because that's the fundamental building block for the entire value chain scale up. And why is that? If you look at whether it is the turbine capital components for the likes of blades, towers, or even the drivetrain, as a matter of fact, and even the balance of plant components like foundations, transition pieces, cables, and even to the extent of installation vessels, all of them are designed based on the turbine technology evolution. So that's the starting point for future evolution. And as you can see here, the average turbine readings across different Asia-Pac markets. And you would notice that China has already surpassed the global average. And in the next three years, they would surpass the European average readings. I would like to draw your attention to the graphic on the right-hand side. As you can see in the region, more than 80% or even 85% of the capacity that's built today is with sub six megawatt turbines in China. But what's happening today, or since the beginning of this year, few turbine OEMs have already installed prototypes of 14 to 16 megawatt turbines in China. And the race doesn't seem to end anytime soon. We're gonna see 18 to 20 megawatt turbines that are currently under the R&D drawing boards would be commercially available in the near future. Now, what sort of opportunities that this open up? We're trying to look at when the upstream fraternity, the supply chain companies, there's an opportunity of roughly $75 billion worth across the tap, turbine capital components. And not all the markets that are entering the offshore wind can stipulate local content because there is already existing capacity in the market. Not to discount the fact that we still need to ramp up the capacity. But if you look at the few years from now, how the supply chain matrix is gonna look like, we're gonna see developments, that's a snapshot that we're presenting. Now, I will bring the concluding slide by once again going back to the demand but shifting the gears a little bit towards green hydrogen. If you look at Australia as an example, it is dominating the global green hydrogen project developments. A whooping 30% of the projects under development around the world, that's near 100 gigawatts of projects are under development in Australia. Not only does this accelerate the demand for green hydrogen, but also it provides an upside potential for offshore wind as well. And we're projecting that just the demand from green hydrogen alone will trigger additional 10% increase in demand for the numbers that I just presented. And that's, we're talking about the 200 billion worth of investments into the APAC offshore markets. That's the market opportunity that we see in the sector. With that, I would conclude my session and hand it back to Stuart. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sashi, for that uh, very interesting overview. I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage now. Uh, we have Joe Nye, uh, General Manager, Offshore Power Asia at Shell Energy. We have Ingan Svigod, Senior Vice President Asia Pacific uh, Renewables and Country Manager Singapore for Equinor. We have Robert Ludecki, GM Hydrogen and Strategic Projects of Iberdrola Australia. Eduardo Carlin, GM APAC for Mainstream Renewable Power. And Shahana uh, Sinevivaranti, I'm not sure I've got that right, uh, CEO Murchison Hydrogen Project. Please make them all welcome.
So this is where you guys uh, in the audience can also, as I said, start to write questions. If you'd like any questions answered by any of the panelists, please uh, submit them via the app. And you can just, when you go into your conference program and you click on the relevant session, you can see a live Q&A tab, and then you can just write your question there, and we will get them up here as well. So I'll start with the panellists. One of the things that I'd like, actually, is for you guys to give the audience an idea of who you are, what's your background, and how have you been, or how did you get into the renewable energy space? So first of all, we'll start right down the other end of the panel, and please tell me how I pronounce your name. You're pretty close. Okay. Oh, sorry, the, the, I'm not sure if you have a hand mic or a uh, mic mic. Are we on? That, that, that looks like, it looked like a thumbs up, is that right? Or? Yeah, I got a thumbs up, yep. yeah. So you pronounce it pretty well, Shahan Senevaratna. It's quite phonetic, just okay. ridiculously long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't worry, I'm the one who had to spell it out on all those uh, exams. Um, so I head up the Murchison Hydrogen Renewables Project for CIP, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, heavily involved in the wind side and the offshore wind side, but uh, with the Energy Transition Fund, uh, we're now looking at those molecules and the clean fuels. My background is uh, in oil and gas and mining, and then moved into renewables a few years ago. Uh, and is the hydrogen, is the Murchison project, is that one of the largest hydrogen projects in the world? Is that where we're it, at? It most certainly is one of the largest in terms of a single phase or a, a stage of development. We're looking at about six gigawatts of onshore wind and solar and about three gigawatts of electrolysis. Really interesting, and we'll get into the hydrogen session a little bit, or the hydrogen topic a little bit later, so I'm looking forward to diving back into that. Eduardo. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eduardo Carlin, and I'm the general manager for mainstream renewable power for the Asia Pacific region, based out of Singapore, but we essentially are present in Vietnam, Philippines, Australia, Indonesia, and South Korea. We've been in the region now for about six years, and um, from mainstream's point of view, and also from my own point of view, I think it's a very vibrant part of the world, many opportunities, and um, as far as my background is concerned, I've been in the renewable energy industry now for 13 years, um, most of which around this part of the world. So I think that many of the challenges have been extensively outlined in the past uh, uh, panel discussions, but I'm sure um, we'll have much more to discuss here now. Thanks very much. Uh, Robert Ludic is my name. Um, I'm GM uh, Hydrogen Strategic Projects for Iberdrola Australia. Um, Iberdrola, as you've probably seen, has, has launched um, into hydrogen um, as probably the fourth stool. So renewables, networks, and customers, and they're looking at, at building out into hydrogen. We have two, two projects in Spain, a 20 megawatt electrolyzer producing green ammonia with Fertibera and a two and a half megawatt hydrogen refueler with Barcelona. Um, my background's investment banking. Um, the first turbine I ever saw was in 1995 and was half a megawatt. Um, and it had a latter structure. Um, so I've been in and around uh, renewables a long time um, and, you know, I really see the opportunity for us to build out hydrogen in Australia. Thanks very much for that. Uh, so did you work in, in the offshore space at all as well? Or no, I'm, 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 rest I'm working solely in the, yep. in the hydrogen space. Great, thank you. Ingen. So I'm Ingrid Svegon. I'm uh, heading up Asia Pacific Renewables for Equinor. Uh, so uh, my background is I've uh, been 20 years with the company, uh, the last eight years in the renewable, building up the renewable uh, business of Equinor, which is fast growing in, in Europe and now also uh, in Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Joe. Hi, yes, Stuart. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Joe Nye. I uh, represent Shell. Um, I'm the general manager for offshore wind here in Asia. Um, I've been 20 years with the company, um, had many experiences across the uh, energy value chain based out of Tokyo. And uh, contrary to my uh, visual looks, I'm actually Dutch. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and it's good to see Shell on the panel. And also, yeah, thank you guys for uh, being part of the sponsorship as well. Um, if we to jump into the topic now, uh, given that you are all 
on this panel, and you're all active in, I mean, this today is all about the APAC region. It's not necessarily about Australia. It's about how maybe we can dive into something around the, the what's happening in Australia and that impact in the broader APAC region. But I'd really like to hear your perspective about the opportunities. We've just heard five uh, people get up and talk about, you know, how all the, uh, the traps of and benefits there are in offshore wind and what we have to look forward to. But if we start to look, maybe start with you, Joe, what do you guys see as being the big drivers in the APAC region for the offshore wind space? Oh, thanks, um, um, Stuart. Um, I, I think the, the main driver here is um, energy security, the drive for, by, um, by governments across the region for um, um, net zero emission targets. And, and thirdly, um, I think it was very much well explained in previous sessions, if you look at Asia Pacific, it has a large population, about 50% of the world, but if you look at the energy demand, it's very much based on fossil fuel still. So they come from a very low base and it has grown so fast and it still has an enormous runway ahead of it. Then there are all the other complications around being island nations, big um, uh, water areas, and deeper waters, which require a floating offshore wind. I think those are drivers that has um, come to a fore in the last years, I would say. I would say also on the back of huge success of offshore wind development to become a major mat mature industry in, in Europe, and then subsequently now also taking root in, in the US. Yeah, Ingen, for yourself. So, uh, yeah, so, so I think um, as the previous uh, speaker also uh, expressed quite well, there are enormous opportunities uh, and also quite significant challenges uh, that is driving this business uh, forward. I think um, for us, it, the fundamentals are, are very much there, um, and that's the reason why we are, we are tapping into, into Asia Pacific now. We see that... Uh, it's a remarkable good fit with offshore wind, uh, and that's why we are why we are here. Um, um, it's uh, it's also a place where we think we have a role to play through our exp offshore wind experience and the flow, especially the floating uh, offshore wind, and also um, we can tap into a supply chain uh, that is very competitive and that we know well uh, from the oil and oil and gas uh, business as well. So so. Um, uh, but I, but I think in terms of, of, of some of the challenges that we see, um, and, and many of the challenges that, that were very well explained in the last session, uh, it's also great opportunities for this region. So uh, to see uh, what is now the first storm or offshore wind uh, industry in, in Europe, um, that this, we see that this is a, a game for, for the, for the long-term players. So you have to see the value of thinking and acting uh, long-term. We as a company, we're used to the fundamentals going up and down, and I think that's also what we, uh, what we are prepared to be part of, uh, of, uh, of in, this, uh, in this business. And I think that another obvious opportunity is, is linked to the supply chain here, that uh, this is not only a supply chain that we can build up for Asia Pacific, but can be a very much global competitive uh, uh, supply chain, and that we can learn from the inefficiencies that we see in Europe. Uh, we are f these days installing uh, and are preparing for the first power on Doggy Bank, which will be one of the world, uh, well, be the uh, biggest offshore wind um, uh, farm in, uh, in, in UK. Um, and and uh, we see that project has taken us more than 10, 10 years. And a lot of those 10 years has been gone to planning and permitting. And that's, I think that's a good uh, example of we need to get that out uh, because that's a time we, this region will not uh, afford to, to, to repeat. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the supply chain. We'll be getting back onto that a, a lot or in, a, in a, just a minute because uh, I think that that's one of, going to be one of the key enablers. And it's funny that if you notice the first round of speakers that we've had on the stage, I don't think we've had a single supply chain company yet on the stage with us as yet. So uh, we're hopeful that we can actually start to attract the supply chain into the market before it's too late. Um, uh, Eduardo, I'd actually like to jump to you uh, to round out the, uh, to the offshore stuff, and then I would like to uh, follow up with the same question to uh, the hydrogen representatives. I think one of the peculiarities about many of the markets in um, Asia Pacific is that compared maybe to the US and Europe, a lot of the electricity supply is dependent on fossil fuels. 
And of course, there is, I think, um, increasing efforts from the policymakers to, let's say, enable an increase of renewable energy penetration. But many of these countries, and in, in mainstream's case, I refer to Vietnam and Philippines more specifically, not only do they have the challenge to substitute an existing fleet of thermal power plants, but they also have to address a very um, sharp increasing demand of electricity, right? Whereas in the US, in Europe, in many cases, um, the effort right now is simply to substitute existing fleets rather than confront with a very um, high growth of um, electricity demand. So the general scenarios in these countries uh, tend to be very different from the ones where mainstream has operated in, um, in, in the past. I mean, we played, I think, quite a significant role in establishing the offshore wind market in the UK um, 13, 14 years ago, particularly when we started developing um, Horn C1 and 2, which eventually we sold to Dong Energy, now Orsted. And um, what we have to, to, to see here in, in, in this part of the world is that, first of all, APAC covers a significant portion of the world. So each country is different. And um, more importantly, I think it's very, imp uh, it's key for players like mainstream, but uh, all of the international players to really try to work out with the uh, local domestic policymakers, with the communities to find the best way forward. Of course, we can draw a lot from the lessons learned in Europe or in other markets, but every country is, um, is peculiar. So it's really uh, working on a, coalition, I would say, similar to what happened precisely in the European um, countries, but implementing that um, in the APAC markets. I think with that regard, Australia has been quite impressive because um, the policymakers here have been open to uh, listening to um, all different stakeholders. And we're also seeing that in other markets. Um, I think uh, earlier today, under Secretary Guevara from the Philippines um, showed a very strong commitment um, from the Department of Energy to promote offshore wind and renewable energy in, in general. So it's having that long-term strategic perspective, which I think will be the key enabler for this industry to be successful here. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo, from the hydrogen side. Oh, sorry, uh, Robert, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, when I did a bit of research for this topic, 52% um, of global emissions in 2022 came from Asia Pacific. So that really underscores the challenge for both offshore wind and hydrogen. A lot of, a lot of that, um, as we've seen with fossil fuels, there's going to be a huge demand from Asia. And hydrogen is probably the carrier that will, make, will be the game changer um, in the energy landscape you can capture and store renewable energy and then transfer it through a vector. And that probably in the first instance will be ammonia and, and methanol. But I, I mean, that is where Australia has a, an amazing opportunity given its abundance of renewable resources and it's developing um, hydrogen and we can really lean in and propel Australia, APAC for zero emissions. Thank you. Uh, Shahan, can you actually comment on I this? Think, I think that's pretty well covered there. Uh, fundamentally, it's uh, more than 50% uh, more than of global emissions are coming out of here, and there's a phenomenal opportunity to utilise resource-rich countries like we have here in Australia uh, to be able to supply a Korean fuel, which will not only decarbonise the region, but go a long way towards uh, achieving global decarbonisation targets. And it's obviously not without challenges, but... Uh, it's definitely a, a big opportunity. But I presume that the merchants is all going to be for export, or are you going to have any of uh... No, we've, we've got the opportunity for both. Obviously, we see the Asian markets as being far more progressed in terms of offtake demand, and we expect that to be the first offtakers, but that does not mean that we can't supply domestic markets. Interesting. 
So we have some questions come in now, and uh, we were going to speak about the supply chain, uh, and I had a question prepared, but uh, there's been a question that's actually written more eloquently than my own, so I shall defer to that. So we have uh, Ashley McDonald, who uh, wrote, what mechanisms do we need to see in Australia to ensure an offshore wind development pipeline is not delayed by supply chain constraints in APAC? And secondly, there's also, I'll top and tail that with another question from Roger Dargaville, who asks, are there opportunities in Australia for manufacturing of wind energy components, blades, towers, foundations, et cetera, or hydrogen components like electrolyzers or other RE technologies like uh, solar or PV or batteries? We'll start again down the end with you, Sean. So I'll jump straight to the hydrogen side. Um, and I think there's a very, very definite opportunity. Um, if we look at the, the power generation side for hydrogen, Obviously, um, from the wind turbines, the blades may be one step removed as a starting point, but definitely towers, segments, etc. There's, there's a real possibility, and there are discussions ongoing on that path. With regards to hydrogen and electrolysis, it will be a timing factor and also a market demand factor. Ultimately, what we want to do is drive the market in order to provide the cost out that's needed. So initially, it may be in terms of um, not necessarily the, the production of the stacks, but rather the assembly of the electrolysis stacks, which can then transition during the first and second stack changeouts towards local manufacturing. And those are the kind of discussions that are taking place with the various electrolyzer vendors at the moment in relation to Murchison as well as other projects. Yep. Rob? Yes, I think the other thing that um, as, the, um, as the presentation before the panel highlighted is the importance of Asia and Asian OEMs. Um, we naturally look here to Western OEMs and that's what we're certainly doing in the hydrogen space. Um, I think that there's going to be a massive opportunity um, and it's working through um, the, the Asian APAC um, electrolyzer technologies and other hydrogen technologies, whether that's compressors, etc. But that's also looking into markets that probably haven't really raised their head yet, and that's something like India, where there's a lot of development going on. And I view that you know, we've seen, let's not try and solve the supply chain by just looking at Western technologies. We need to look beyond that. Thank you very much. Eduardo, from the offshore side? I think that... Um there is a unique opportunity for Australia really to establish itself as uh, a player in the supply chain for offshore wind. If we look at it from a pure short-term um, outlook, obviously it's challenging. The costs here in Australia are high, um, and that ranges from components to, um, to labor costs. But if Australia takes a more longer-term look which I think is what's um, ongoing at the moment, then there is really a, a window of opportunity for Australia to slowly um, establish itself in key sectors of the supply chain for offshore wind for its own domestic market, but also for the entire region. I mean, with the increasing geopolitical tensions um, in the world, having a diversified supply chain, I think, is beneficial. Of course, it might come at some cost in the short term, but in the long term, I think there would be wider benefits for the industry. And so um, I do see this as a, as a strong opportunity for Australia. Thanks. Ingen? Yeah, I think to go back to the fundamentals again, for, for supply chain to invest in Australia, you need to see scale and ambition, you need to see speed in execution, uh, and, and you need to see uh, predictability. Uh, and, and those are uh, topics uh, throughout, uh, throughout this, this morning, but I, I think that's again where we, we need to be smart about what Australian su uh, suppliers should, should focus uh, on uh, versus where does it make sense to collaborate across. We also see, see uh, very strong opportunities for, for regional uh, collaborations on the supply chain that will highly benefit uh, the growth in Australia. But I, I think that Australia is doing a lot of the, the things that we are, we are we're looking for, but, but it also comes back to creating that predictability for, for supply chain so they know that their, their project will, will be there. 
Joe? Uh, so to round out, I think um, it's, it's no doubt that the opportunity for offshore wind and for hydrogen are tremendous in this region. Um, observation is that you need three things to get this really on track and grow. Number one is really around teamwork, making sure that government, policymakers, industry work together to create that enabling, supporting framework for industry to grow. Secondly, a roadmap where predictability and targets, what my previous speaker also mentioned, is very important to ensure that investors will come in and feel that it's an industry here to stay. And finally, um, it's very much around then the um, ensuring that there's a cadence for these projects to be coming um, on stream, by ensuring that they are viable commercially. Um, many of these lessons learned from other markets are already taken on board by here in Australia, and that's very commendable. And I, I think we can be very, very proud to the Australian government for what they have achieved so far. With respect to hydrogen, we mentioned just now around production of hydrogen and the excellent resources that Australia represents. What Shell has been doing together with partners has been experimenting shipping liquefied hydrogen from the port of Hastings to Kobe in Japan. That's a journey of 9,000 kilometers. We liquefy hydrogen and cool it down all the way to minus 250 degrees, and it's 60% less colder than what we currently ship LNG with, liquefied natural gas. I think those um, projects, together with partners, together with governments, will help us to put those different dots on the horizon and connect the supply chain and energy system for the future. And uh, we're very, very interested to continue that journey with our partners. Okay, maybe in this, I'll, I'll open this up for the entire panel. So we have um, a scenario where we if you look at all of the reports that are coming out, we've got huge amounts of volume of, of wind capacity that we're expected to get online uh, in the next decade, for example. Um, we have, depending on some the analysis, we have some people think that we have more than uh, enough capacity to service all of these. Others feel that we're going to be missing capacity. In the APAC region, I think if we look at when uh, I think the first Gippsland projects were meant to come online, it was around 2028 to 2030, 32, sometime between there, depending on your optimism. Um, if you look at things like uh, nacelle capacity, vessel capacity, blade capacity, I mean, we're competing in the APAC region, we're competing with the US, we're, we will be competing with Europe, we'll be competing with maybe Latin America by that stage as well. Is there really enough capacity? Do you, as developers, do you really think that you're going to be able to get your components in the time frame where we're, where we're seeing? Anyone brave enough to jump in on that one to start off with, or do we have to name and shame? <laughs> I think it's a good question because probably no one has the definite answer to this. Um, ultimately, it's very clear that the amount of work that needs to be done for the supply chain to meet the demands is impressive. I think earlier on um, in the last um, panel presentation, one of the speakers showed uh, the amount of, um, or the extension of um, upgrades that need to take place, the amount of new capacity that needs to be introduced to meet that increasing demand. But going back to my earlier point, if there is a general, let's say, um, uh, effort that unites all of the key stakeholders in this process, I think then it's achievable. But it really needs to be um, a united effort with a long-term strategic uh, um, thinking. It cannot only be based on how much uh, will the electricity be sold for in five years from now. It really needs to be a, a long-term effort to, to ensure that we overcome this supply chain um, uh, uh, challenge. Yeah. I'll go to Ingen and then to Sean. Ingen first. Yeah, two points. First, uh, I, I think it's not a matter of believing or not believing. I think it's a matter of working together. So you really have to to work together with the supply chain to make sure that you are you are um, driving the development in the in the same speed. And I think that's the bottleneck we are struggling with right right now. Um, and I, I think Asia Pacific is in uh, is in also a good position that we still have time 
to build to make those investments. Uh, this is a, a region that will have their, uh, their massive growth 2030 and, and beyond. So uh, knowing what is happening now, learning from the bottlenecks uh, uh, challenges we have now to uh, enable uh, that supply chain to invest uh, early enough is, uh, is an opportunity. That sounds really like sage advice. Sean? If I, if I look at it from a slightly different perspective, sorry if I change your question around a bit, no but how do you create that supply chain? And the only way we're going to create that supply chain, because we need those same turbines, slightly different versions of it for onshore, is if there's a market for it. And the only way there's a market for it is if there's an offtake market. So what we really need to do from a hydrogen point of view is create that standardization that will generate liquidity in the market. And if there's liquidity in the market, and there's a channel for developers to develop projects uh, with the surety of sales, then I guarantee you the OEMs will come to the party uh, when they see where the money is. Actually, that segues nicely into another question we had prepared for the panellists around the cost of hydrogen and how do we actually drive the cost of hydrogen. So is there, what, what are the plans to, uh, is this purely going to be driven by market forces or how is that going to work? I, I truly believe it's going to be a scale. So scale is ultimately going to be the primary driver for the cost of hydrogen. And with scale, we'll start seeing costs drop and we'll start seeing the price reductions that everyone's looking for. But the only way you get scale, is going back and repeating myself, uh, is to try and get liquidity in the market. But there are some factors there or forces there where we can have regulatory policy. I mean, if we have consistency of policy looking at uh, making sure that we are aligned with the longer term objectives of decarbonisation and also facilitating early demand. So CFD mechanisms, hard targets, those from a government point of view and from a regional point of view will help drive the market and thereby drive those cost outs. That's right. I think um, you must read my notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree on scale. I just don't think, you know, we've got to stop playing around with 20, 50 megawatt projects. We've got to focus on, focus on scale. Um, I think you've got to actually move to where it is close to commercial today, and that is ammonia and methanol. Um, and I think that those, though that will start to drive, um, that will start to drive scale. I think policy, policy settings are very important and how do you sort of change those policy settings in time and how do you encourage the use of a, of a green product that was, probably, that was previously made out of a fossil fuel. So I think there's, there's a lot, of, lot in that, but I think also that governments need to look at how they're going to do that. Let's face it, we're not the US, we're not Europe, we can't compete with those, those schemes, but I think as we have the scale, we have the land, we have the water, and we have the renewables. Great. So now we talk about regional collaboration, and you guys represent uh, a panel full of uh, companies that have operations in many jurisdictions, and you deal with individual governments around the globe. Uh, and particularly in the APAC region, where we have a diverse range of governments in the various markets around APAC. Do we, we as an industry need to play a, a, a role here in actually driving this regional collaboration? Because it's not always the governments that look, they look over their shoulder and see what the next government is doing. What role does industry play in actually driving these collaboration in the region? Joe? No, I think that's an excellent question. and. Um and for, for me, it's uh, being in this industry for quite some time now, I, I'm very encouraged what, uh, what, for instance, GWEG is doing or what the World Bank is doing or what the industry fora like this is doing, bringing together the stakeholders in the industry, the, well, we're missing the suppliers here today, but they're here, they're just they're here. <laughs> we have the developers, we have the government stakeholders, but we also have government stakeholders and policymakers from different countries who are coming together and seeing is believing, hearing and discussing what works, what doesn't work, getting into the details of the auction policies for offshore wind or support mechanisms for hydrogen to get it at scale. It is a long journey. I think Ben from um, GWAC mentioned yesterday, it took us 40 years to get to one terawatt installed capacity for wind, 40 years, but it's probably going to take us 10 years to get to the next terawatt. 
So that type of acceleration is only possible through the efforts of all of us here in the room, across the countries that we are operating in and bringing the best practice together. And probably this is also what we will be seeing in the hydrogen space and any connectivity between offshore wind and hydrogen. We love you quoting Jaywick, so thank you for that, Jay. We'll keep you going on this panel for the next time. Ingen. Yeah, so, so um, again, I think, I think we are in a time now where we see the cost of uh, lack of collaboration, um, and, and the lack of collaboration will, will um, increase uh, time span on developing project, and it will also increase, increase the costs. So I think one, one approach is to be aligned as an industry as well, uh, to make sure that we, are, um, that we have a message uh, towards, um, towards governments and that we are trying to also to, to guide them. I should be careful of coming here as a European expert and tell exactly how to, how to do this, because every market will have its own uh, uh, rights and, and drivers for, for, for creating their own cost space and, and, and execution speed. But at least being very aware of the cost sensitivities linked to supply chain, for example, being aware of the cost sensitivities uh, linked to not aligning on a standard across, meaning that you can't use the same vessels or you can't use the same equipment. Those are very specific uh, measures that you can do to, to enable uh, uh, that, that collaboration. And so what will Equinor specifically be doing in to, do, to drive that? I think we will continue to, to work on what we're doing today. As for Asia specific, um, uh, specifically, uh, we, we, we are working on a supply chain uh, plan in terms of how we, uh, where our project will be with, uh, in Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, Vietnam, potentially other uh, markets as well. Where, how will the supply chain work best across, uh, across markets uh, also? Very different markets uh, across, uh, across these regions. Where do we see synergies and where don't we see synergies? And also, we also have synergies uh, between, between uh, Asia Pacific markets and our ambitions in California, for example. So you, you have, uh, you have uh, regional and, and also global uh, synergies too. Um, and that that's, I think is extremely key for, for Asia Pacific that is dependent on on the successful growth of floating uh, offshore wind as well. Thank you. Oh, look, I think it's partnerships. That this is this is um, you know this is massive, and it's you know a lot of large companies like to do it themselves. Um, but I think that as we've seen with more and more tie-ups, um, that you're going to see partnerships become more and more important and that, you know, working very closely and collaborating along that supply chain. Because without those partnerships, no, nothing will get delivered. And I think, you know, government has sort of a very federal government, state governments. I think also in Australia, we want to avoid that we have eight or nine standards of for hydrogen, for example. We have one federal standard, that was what that government can drive those sort of changes where effectively you're not solving to every state that you operate in. Thank you. Eduardo? I think there are two key elements. The first one is recognizing that each country is different and when we approach, let's say, policymakers in the various different APAC jurisdictions that we come across as collaborative and constructive. Um, what I have seen in the past in some of the um, uh, markets we operate in is that international companies come in kind of wanting to dictate the rules to governments and I don't think that's a constructive way of, of doing things. Um, that's a, a key element. The other one, um, I think I would agree very much with Robert, is around partnerships. It's really working with the governments, with local stakeholders, with the local communities, with local companies. Um, that's what Mainstream has done across all the different jurisdictions we operate in globally, is really working closely with um, the local stakeholders. Now, at the same time, I guess, to make sure that um, the, the, the governments also have a high level of credibility with, um, with uh, the key stakeholders in the industries to ensure that whatever the industry promises um, then delivers, uh, and, and I think Jose made that point uh, earlier on, um, whatever you know, developers or IPPs are promising, they really need to deliver because 
in some of the markets we see timelines being committed which aren't realistic, prices which aren't realistic, and all of that then undermines the entire industry. Thank you. Uh, and due to poor time management, I have left us too short to get a final answer, but, but maybe if we start with uh, the panels, each of, get a reflection from each of the panellists about the biggest enabler that we're going to see that we, you would like to see happen in the APAC region that's going to accelerate the uptake and actual rollout of offshore wind and green hydrogen in the region. I think it was something that uh, Malcolm Turnbull said this morning. It's very much about standardisation. If we can achieve standardisation, aggregators and everyone out there is going to want their product that they own, that they purchase, to be able to be traded anywhere in the world. So if we can have uniformity and standardisation, we'll create the market and have the drive that comes from it. Nice and succinct, thank you. Right I think long-term and strategic um, policy making with the involvement of all key stakeholders. And I think for us as developers and independent power producers, not look upon each other as competitors, but really as uh, collaborators, because it's such a big industry. There's going to be space for everyone if we work together properly. Thank you. Richard? Oh, look, I think I have done a lot to add that standardisation policy settings and um, partnerships would be where I would um, summarise the way forward. Ingen. Uh, to be very specific, floating offshore wind need to happen in Asia Pacific. Um, that's also one of the reasons why we're here, uh, to, to, to accelerate that. To, that Asia Pacific can take the role as a leader uh, within, within and really taking it down from, from, uh, from the positions we are today where the technology is proven. And yes, we, we celebrated Hywind Tampen last week, uh, uh, 88 megawatts um, uh, in, in Norway with a floating technology. So we know it works, but it needs to be scaled. We need, uh, and that's why we are planning the next project in, in Korea, which would be 10 times the size. So and that's, that's really the opportunity in Asia Pacific. And I'm glad you mentioned floating offshore wind. We, we had hoped to cover a little bit more of that in this panel today, but we have a session this afternoon and a session tomorrow afternoon on floating offshore wind. So anyone interested in floating offshore wind, there's going to be lots of time to cover those uh, conversations. Joe, the final word. No, I think um, three things here. One is enabling regulatory framework. Number two would be ambitious targets pinned down with a specific roadmap. And thirdly, with, is ensuring that there's commercial viability for the future energy system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so with that, uh, could you please welcome, or could you please thank, rather, all of our panelists for their wonderful contribution for this panel. <laughs> and uh, now, now we move into the uh, luncheon break. And I just need to make sure that there's no, uh, that we have no videos. Oh, actually, we do have a video, I think, now that we have to play before we move to the luncheon uh, interval. One move means countless opportunities to provide clean electricity that could power our homes, our cars, even our morning coffee. Shell is building an integrated power business to provide more renewable and low carbon electricity. Wind power is crucial for this future. Shell's wind story starts in 2000 helping construct the UK's first offshore wind turbines. Today, we are developing a portfolio of around 11 gigawatts of potential offshore wind projects across the USA, Europe and Asia. Like the Holland Zeekust Nord Wind Farm, which will power Europe's largest renewable hydrogen plant, helping industry and heavy-duty transport decarbonise. We also unlock the potential of wind resources in deeper waters by advancing floating offshore wind. With over 50 years of experience working offshore, we always put safety first. And we work with the industry to develop our projects with respect for nature and local communities. 
Shell's target is to become a net zero emissions business by 2050. And so with that, we will uh, resume the, we'll be, uh, uh, we will be adding an additional 15 minutes to the luncheon interval. So there's still lots of time to eat. And so we'll meet back in here at, I think it was, uh, sorry, what was, Hannah? 2 p.m. Thanks very much. Enjoy your lunch, everyone. <laughs>